Welcome to the Cold Case Christianity Broadcast, the only Christian case-making program hosted by a cold case homicide detective. Jay Warner Wallace has been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Court TV, and Dateline. For more information about Jim's work and the case for Christianity, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. Now, here's your host, Jay Warner Wallace. Thanks for joining us at Cold Case Christianity. I'm Jay Warner Wallace. Uh, today we're going to talk about an issue that I visited about a year ago. And I look back at our archives. You can see all of our shows are archived on our YouTube page. And I think we last talked about this issue. And I showed you a short clip I'm going to show you again today about a year ago. So if you aren't caught up on our episodes, this will be new to you. But I think it's an important issue. And let me tell you why I'm going to cover it again. I got an email from a listener, from a watcher of the show who said that she was teaching a Bible study on uh, the book of Acts and remembered that I had dated the book of Acts in a certain way and wanted to kind of revisit that with her students and couldn't remember how we did it. She saw me at a presentation at her church. I get a chance to go around the country and uh, speak on these issues. And sure enough, I was in her church in Arkansas when she saw this presentation. Now, I'm going to go ahead and review some of that with you, but I really don't do this in order to make a case for the dating of the book of Acts. Instead, I've done a, a, some work trying to figure out for myself how early the Gospels were actually written. And why is that important? Uh, it's important to me as an investigator because when I first became interested in the Gospels, I was an atheist, but I did have a skill set as a detective, and I had interviewed a lot of eyewitnesses over the years, and had developed a strategy taken from the jury instructions in the state of California, which dictate how we are to evaluate eyewitnesses on the stand. And there are four major categories that we evaluate, and one of them is simply, were the witnesses really there when they said they were? Because if, we, if they weren't there, if we can demonstrate they weren't there, then they are disqualified altogether as witnesses. And I always thought, well, that's going to be the problem, I think, with the Gospels. Because I'd listened to all the kind of complaints over the years from atheists that these Gospels are written very, very late because we only happen to have, you know, maybe the first complete copy of the Gospels, of any particular Gospel, or of the entire New Testament set of Gospels is relatively late in history. So do we think they were written that late? Or do we think we just happen to have, you know, a transmission of a document from a very early date to the where we actually have full, complete sets? That was important to me. So the early dating of the Gospels was just one step in this process I took, which I talk about in Cold Case Christianity. Now, I just want to say that, that I want to offer this to you because uh, I think it's important for us, when we make a case for what we believe to non-believers, to be able to cover the issues in a way that's compelling for non-believers to hear it. Even for our friends who are believers. And here's why I say that. I mean, I, I remember looking at some of the research on this. And when you read what other apologists have written about this topic, it's often written uh, from, the kind of, from the perspective of a historian. So the kinds of manuscript evidence we would look at and how other historical documents have been transmitted. This is all incredibly important stuff. But the minute you start talking to your friends from the perspective of a uh, historian or from some kind of textual criticism, Get ready to have them gloss over. Their eyes are going to gloss. They're going to, oh my gosh, really? I mean, it's just not compelling. I think for a lot of people, I just have a hard time getting interested in the techniques and strategies and uh, factors and attributes and characteristics that historians look at to document, to, to date documents or to figure out if they're reliable. I think there's just not a lot of us who are interested in those kinds of things. As a matter of fact, I think you'll see this because if I was to tell people, hey, and I'm going to be invited to your church to speak next week on textual criticism in early church history, get ready for no one to attend. Because those two things, when you just talk about them, uh, I'm making a case, I'm going to talk to you about the early transmission of the documents and what kind of textual evidence we have. To, and I'm also going to talk to you about the early church history and transmission of the documents. Well, yeah, okay, that sounds pretty academic and pretty boring. And I think for most lay-level audiences are not going to be interested if I take that approach. I'll just be honest with you. And that concerns me because for the most part, uh, if, I, if I'm honest with you, the, the, the people I meet in churches are really not engaged in these issues. They've never even looked at the evidence, most of them. And they certainly don't know what kind of academic work has been done out there. But if you were to tell them, hey, next week we're going to have a cold case detective who's going to come in and tell you and evaluate the eyewitness accounts of the Gospels the same way you would evaluate any murder suspect, that, I think, sounds interesting. Now, I'm not saying that to toot my own horn, because I'm not at all. I think anyone who's doing the work 
in a way that is compelling. Uh, let's face it, most TV dramas are built around first responders of some kind. Uh, doctors, when I hear a doctor is going to talk about the resurrection or talk about the uh, the crucifixion and the elements of death that are related to the crucifixion, I get interested. Why? Because that doctor is speaking about something that the culture is already fascinated with to begin with. How many shows on TV are about doctors, emergency rooms, uh, first responders in the medical profession? These are interesting things to us. So when you hear someone who want to give it to you from the perspective that the culture is already interested in, I think you're far more likely to get your friends and um, family members interested in the topic. So I want to offer this key point about the Gospels as a way to, 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 for, to kind of equip you, if you're a Christian making this case, and also to kind of energize you to share it with friends because you're not going to be able to share it from the perspective of a detective working a crime. Because the first thing I want to evaluate in an eyewitness is were they really there? And it turns out that that is um, really something we can do with the Gospels. It's all going to come down to how early were these documents written. Remember, it's much earlier, much easier rather to tell a lie if you tell it very late in history so that all the other people who were alive to see the way it really happened have already died. Then they can't call you out as a liar, right? Or you tell it, if you're going to tell it early, you tell it well outside the region. So nobody can, you can never get back to the people who would know better, better, who actually were in the region and saw what happened. So if you're going to tell a lie, you're smart if you tell it very late when everyone's already dead or out of the region. If you're telling this claim, making this claim, uh, describing this account, providing these details early in the region, you better be accurate because people are going to cross check you. And that is what I was, I was really curious about, what I was most interested in as a, a non-believer who was evaluating the, the documents, the Christian Gospels, for the first time. So what I want to do right now is play the same clip I've played before. If you haven't seen it yet, I'll give you a chance to see a part of the presentation I do of the overview of Cold Case Christianity. And it just deals with the early dating timeline. I'll tell you how to get that timeline also so you can have a copy for yourself when this is over. But I want to just show you the case for why I believe the Gospels are, not, are written early and in the region. And then at the end of it, I'll tell you why I think that one issue knocks down a lot of objections. Even objections you might not think it knocks down. We'll talk about that when we return from this video. So take a look at this. This is from a church presentation. Just focused on just the early dating issue of the Gospels. And that's the first test for the Gospels, it seems to me. We have to find out, are the Gospels written early enough so that the people who say they wrote them could actually have been there to see what they say they saw? Make sense? So here we have the ministry of Jesus, 30 to 33 AD, and we have the first place that the church comes together and says, okay, these are the reliable eyewitness accounts you guys can trust. That's not the Council of Nicaea, that's the Council of Laodicea, not until 363 AD does anybody say, these are the gospels we can trust. What could have happened between those 330 years? It's a lot of time. What if the gospels were actually written late, like much closer to the time of the council? than they were to the time of the event. You shouldn't trust them because that means they're written by people who weren't even present at the time of the actual events. They, if that's the case, if they're written late, you can just chuck that stuff. I would not trust a witness who came to me who was born in 1975 and tried to tell me about a crime that occurred in 1970. You couldn't call her a witness. That's the problem. On the other hand, if we can figure out that these were written earlier, closer to the time of Jesus' actual life, we can at least know that the first criteria has been met. Could they still be lying? Yes. But at least we would know they're lying at the time of the actual event. That'll help us. So we're going to take a look at this right now. How do we know when these were written? When were the Gospels written? Well, I was moved when I read through the Gospels. I'm looking for pieces of circumstantial evidence to build a circumstantial case. It seems to me what's missing in the Gospels, for example, is any description of the destruction of the temple. It'd be wise to include it, it seems to me, because Jesus is going to talk about it, he's going to predict the destruction in Matthew 23. Why wouldn't you include the actual destruction of the temple? It's going to happen in 70 AD when the Roman uh, um, uh, army comes in and uh, sieges. As a matter of fact, the siege of the city is also missing. 
They laid a siege around the city about two or three years before the actual destruction of the temple. It'd be a great opportunity for Peter when he's talking in 1 Peter about suffering to reference the siege of Jerusalem where they starved out and eventually collapsed the walls and destroyed the temple. What a great place to talk about suffering. Why is there no mention of the siege anywhere in Scripture? Why is there no mention of, of Paul's death? Why is he still alive at the book of Acts when it ends? You know he dies around 64, 67. He's martyred in Rome. Why not mention his martyrdom? I mean, you mentioned Stephen's martyrdom in the book of Acts. You mentioned the martyrdom of James, the brother of John. Paul's a pretty big figure in the book of Acts. Why don't you mention his death? Why don't you mention Peter's death? Why don't you mention James, the brother of Jesus? He dies in 61. The three biggest players in the book of Acts, and you don't describe their death? Why not? Do you know why, right? Because the books of Acts was written before. The book of Acts is written before all these things actually occurred. That's the most reasonable inference from the evidence is that Luke is writing sometime before these events had occurred. I'm going to be conservative. I'll put it right here at 60. We don't know how much earlier he actually wrote it, but 60 is fair at least because it would at least get, uh, James is not mentioned. He has 61, so we'll go one year before that just to be safe. But we also know that Luke tells us he writes two books. What's he write before the book of Acts? The Gospel of Luke. Ah, oh, now we've got to predate the Gospel of Luke. That's going to come sometime before the book of Acts. How much earlier? I put it at 53. Why? Because of a couple of pieces of internal evidence. First of all, we see that he tells us in the book of Acts, in the first chapter, that he writes something prior to this. And he mentions someone named Theophilus. He'll also mention that name in the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. So that's the book he's writing prior to this. I think it's fair to assess that that way, to examine it that way. But look at what Paul does here in a letter to, first, uh, to Timothy, called 1 Timothy. He writes this letter around 63, 64. I'll be honest with you, there are some biblical skeptics who don't even want to attribute this letter to Paul. They'll say this letter to Timothy is not a genuine Pauline letter. I, I think it is, but there are skeptics. I'll just give you that so you have a fair warning. But here's what um, Paul writes to Timothy. He says, look, I love this when I first read it because I was, a, as a detective, I'm trying to figure out what would the New Testament people call Scripture? Are they just referring to the Old Testament? I need, is there any internal evidence that tells me what the canon is very early in history? Look at what Paul says, though. He says to Timothy, the elders who direct the affairs of the church are well worthy of double honor, especially those for whose work is preaching and teaching. For the Scripture says, oh, that's great. Thanks for saying that, Paul, because now I'm going to figure out, you're going to about to tell me what you think Scripture is. I want to know. And he says, two quotes. Do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain. Where's that from? Deuteronomy, Old Testament. Then he says, well, I mentioned two pieces of scripture. He says, the worker deserves his wages. Where does that come from? Well, that's not an Old Testament passage. That's a New Testament passage from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. So he's quoting Luke's gospel as early as 63 AD and calling it scripture to somebody who should know if it is or isn't. Now, what's great about that is it appears it would be out there longer, right? It's probably been around for a while longer than that. That's why Timothy recognizes it as scripture. But how much earlier has it been out there? Well, I look at another book that no skeptic doubts came from Paul. Even Bart Ehrman, the famous um, biblical skeptic, would agree that this is a genuine Pauline document. And unfortunately, it's much earlier than 1 Timothy. It's at 53 to 57, where Paul is going to describe the Lord's Supper. And when he describes it, I first read it, I thought, that's interesting, because every gospel writer describes the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is in every single gospel. But only one writer describes it the way that Paul does, saying that when Jesus did it, he said, drink this in remembrance of me. Well, where does that come from? Got any guesses? He is quoting Luke in chapter 22. So he's referring to Luke twice in his writing, and in one of these, he's writing as early as 53 to 57, and I think he's referencing the exact same thing that Luke is referencing. There's good reason to believe that Luke's gospel then has to predate this, and I would just put it, I won't predate it too much, I'll just put it at the exact same date. How's that, 53, just to be safe? I think that's reasonable. Now, I remember when I first started examining the Gospels, I was struck by um, the claims of Mark. Who the heck is Mark? He's not an eyewitness. Why is he writing a Gospel? Well, in the first century, a church leader named Papias wrote that Mark was chronicling the teaching of Peter. And Papias wrote that he wasn't trying to be all that careful about order. 
he was really trying to be more careful about accuracy. So it's not an orderly account, it's an accurate account, according to Papias in the first century. That was interesting to me because Luke, when he writes his gospel, he starts it off by saying that many have undertaken to drop an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So Luke's not an eyewitness, he's a historian. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good to me also to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. That's interesting. If you're writing an historical account, wouldn't I assume it's orderly? I think that Luke here is quite possibly referring to the disorderly account of Mark. His is now an orderly account. Who does he quote, by the way, more than anyone else in his gospel? Mark. So I have to place Mark ahead of Luke. I'm not going to place him a lot ahead of Luke, but a little bit. And that puts us within the, very easily within the lifetime of the eyewitnesses. The early dating of the Gospels, I think, is actually the best inference from the circumstantial evidence. And if it's early, there are problems for those who are skeptical because you've got to say to yourself, well, did it change over time? Or and it doesn't mean it's true. It just means it's written, at least, at the time that an eyewitness would have written it. By the way, why didn't they write it right away? Why did they wait 12, 15 years to write it? I'm thinking, why didn't they take notes and like sit that thing on Facebook right away? That's what I would have done. Well, because I think that the uh, genuinely thought, the apostles genuinely thought that, that Jesus would come back in their lifetime. And if that's the case, there's not much need aside from orally. Let's get the information out quickly because he's going to be back any day now. And then after they see people like Stephen and James being martyred, the brother of John, you start to see gospels appear. Now it's time to start writing stuff down. We're not sure when he's coming back. Present, I think we can ask, ask that. I, I, I have an entire 25, 30 minutes we could do just on verification, internal and external. So I'm just going to have to, sorry, we'll say it's in the book, but I love this aspect of using outside sources, internal corroboration of, of language and government and all kinds of references that the scriptures make. Uh, you know, I did 20, 26 years working casework, and the better half of that in the end was working cold cases. And those cases got on national media. I mean, I think I've been on Dateline more than any other detective in the country. And the people who are involved in the process, if it's not that show or other media shows, are not always believers, but they get a sense of, well, this guy can puzzle a case together. Not that I am the only one who can do that, but you do develop that skill set. If you're working in this industry, trust me, if you're out there watching this video, you know, if you're a cop, how to put a case together. So once you've demonstrated that thing for people, they may not agree with your conclusion, but remember, the evidence doesn't say anything. And science doesn't say anything. It's scientists and evidence evaluators that say something. So we're all looking at the same data points. We're all looking at the same evidence. I've got to draw an inference from the evidence, and I land it this way. Now, you may not agree with my inferences, but I think you can least respect the fact that I've done the homework of presenting the evidence so an audience can assess it for themselves. So that's why I think I have supporters who don't agree with my inferences, but they respect the process. And that's what, one of the things I, I try to do uniquely in God's crime scene. I'm trying to give the readers not just hear the facts, but here are how detectives assemble facts to, to develop a case. Here are the processes, the rules that we obey, the, how we put a cumulative case together. You know, how do we make cases? That's what I want you to come away with also, not just hear the facts, because you can get that out of any book. I want this to be unique in the sense that this is a book that not only gives you the data, but it instructs you on how to pay, uh, build a case, how to put the data together. My name is Jay Warner Wallace, and I'm a cold case homicide detective. Cold case investigations can teach us a lot about how to investigate the claims of Christianity. Cold case detectives examine events in the distant past for which there are often no living eyewitnesses and little, if any, forensic evidence. The Gospels also record an event in the distant past for which there are no living eyewitnesses and no forensic evidence. The skills I've learned as a cold case detective can help you determine if the Gospels are true. Are the Gospel writers reliable eyewitnesses? Can they be trusted? 
Has their testimony been corrupted over the years? What can we conclude about Jesus from the Gospel eyewitness accounts? I hope you'll read Cold Case Christianity to discover how evidence is examined and what this evidence tells us about Jesus. Take another look at the claims of Christianity from the perspective of a detective. Okay, now you've had a chance to see what the evidence demonstrates related to the early dating of the Gospels. Now, it's interesting about that is that I think it solves a number of problems for us as Christians when we're trying to explain to others why we think these documents are reliable. Now, also, I think it answers a number of objections. Think about this for a second. If we know these are actually early, as early as this evidence demonstrates, and even somebody who's as skeptical as a Bart Ehrman, who's written many books against the reliability of Scripture, he would even agree that the earliest documents we have that describe the life and ministry of Jesus are the four canonical Gospels written in the very region where these occurred. These are the earliest documents we have. Now, he may disagree about how early they are, but he would agree these are much earlier than any other non-canonical we have. Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Philip, these very late heretical documents that do not contain truth about Jesus because they're not written by anyone who actually knew him. They are not written by eyewitnesses because they're written so late in history that they could not have been written by somebody who was actually alive to see Jesus. That's a key thing. The early dating of our Gospels actually eliminates a lot of other nonsense that you see used in movies and in different books, the Da Vinci Code, to make a case for some other form of Jesus than the true form of Jesus. Because we know that the early dating is the first criteria that has to be assessed. And clearly, those documents that these films are based on are not written early enough to have been written by anybody who actually knew Jesus or to be vetted. Interestingly, when the first church uh, fathers, when the first leaders of the church saw the emergence of these late Gospels, they called them out. And we have early church documents calling out the appearance of these late Gospels. So don't be fooled by, non -go by the uh, non-canonical Gospels, those Gospels that are very late in history that are not a part of our canon. As a matter of fact, one of the, the most important criteria for including a document in the Bible was simply the eyewitness authority of its authors. So that's why you have books like uh, the letters of Paul in the Gospels, but you don't have First Clement, an early letter that was used in many congregations that was loved by many early Christians, but it's written by a student of Paul and not somebody who actually met Jesus on the road to Damascus or anywhere else. And therefore, Clement's beautiful letter is not included in Scripture while Paul's are because he has the authority of an eyewitness. Now, here's another thing that early dating does to help you. Uh, you know that if you see something in Scripture and you're kind of scratching your head about it, you're thinking, wow, is this a contradiction? Because it appears that one gospel is saying something different than the other. Well, that's something that you might think, well, okay, I can see how maybe there's some contradictions if these first appear hundreds of years in different regions where they're not being cross-checked. or Then I can see why well, one author might say something different than another. But if these are actually early and these documents coexisted, for early Christians who had access to the eyewitnesses, to people who actually saw the events, then clearly what may appear to be a contradiction for you and I did not appear to bother the earliest people who held these documents because they made no effort to take these out of the documents. That's very interesting. Think about that for a second. If we have good reason to believe that early believers, early followers of Christ, early members of the church, possessed these early documents simultaneously, for example, we know that Mark's document is used a lot, and Mark's testimony from Peter is used a lot by Luke. If these two documents are available to groups simultaneously, then why wouldn't they simply have removed the, the alleged errors? Because they, were, for whatever reason, were not seen as a problem by the earliest readers, and we know now that there were very early readers who had access to the events, either by way of, a, of an eyewitness, or otherwise. And so this is why I think that the early dating actually removes a lot of alleged objections because I know if these documents are early, I've got to figure out how is it that these two things could be said slightly differently yet both be true. And I'm not assuming up front these are late documents written in different regions and therefore I've got some problems because one person has no idea, I guess, what the other person is saying. He's not trying to align his story. Well, no, these are written early 
in the region and no one's making an effort to, to make changes because they recognize that something about both accounts was rich and true. And although it may appear different to us thousands of years later, it did not appear to be a problem for the first readers who made no effort to change it. The early dating, I think, actually addresses other issues even like alleged contradictions or differences between the Gospels, these, I think, could be, made, uh, could be explained as true contradictions if they're late in history, not so easy to describe as true contradictions if they are early in history. That's why I think the early dating does a lot to remove other um, uh, objections you might have. Now, if you go back into our archive, you'll see that from December of last year, we did actually post the kind of next question you might ask, which is, okay, if they're early, how do we know they haven't been altered over time? That's another issue altogether. That is what is now kind of famously been called the chain of custody, which we introduced with cold case Christianity. We did that as an effort to kind of show you a detective's model for testing the transmission of any piece of evidence. And we offered that. You can see that also on our website. Now, I will be writing about this uh, this week at coldcasechristianity.com. Now, by the time you actually see this episode, there'll be an article posted at our website, go under writings, go under biblical reliability, and you will find the article on why the early dating is and why I believe that the Gospels were written early. And we make the same kind of case in writing that I just offered to you in the video. What's great about that is it allows you to print it because every article is print ready without all the other stuff on the website. And it allows you to download it as a PDF if you want to take it with you. But even better, if you go into the face page at coldcasechristianity.com and look in the right uh, menu bar, you will see a little box that you can click to get all the Bible inserts that I've developed over the years that you can print out their Bible sheet size. You can stick them in your Bible. There's one for the early dating of the Gospels, and it has that timeline that you just saw. The timeline that it begins with the book of Acts and the temple destruction all the way through to the dating of Mark. That is something you can actually print out, stick in your Bible, and make the case to others. Now, I hope what we've done is given you a way to get to the early dating of the Gospels that is not the kind of classic academic historian's approach, but comes down to kind of making a case the way you would as a detective. Hopefully, you can get engages you, and then it helps you to engage others with the truth of the Christian worldview. Hope that helps you, and I'll see you right here next week at Cold Case Christianity. Thanks for joining us at the Cold Case Christianity broadcast. If you're interested in more information about this week's topic, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For a thorough investigation of the reliability of the New Testament Gospels in the case for Christianity, be sure to purchase Cold Case Christianity, a homicide detective investigates the claims of the Gospels. It's available wherever books are sold.